Ooh, so it looks like we live. Um, so, hey, family, this is Dave on Love. This is Director of Public Policy Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Um, this is part two of our conversation about the importance of um, building Black infrastructure. You know, we talk about Black power. It's not just about, you know, resisting white supremacy. It's about building systems to, to flourish and to counter the systems that oppress Black people. Um, and so we want it to be really intentional um, about having that conversation. Um, it kind of started um, from the kind of national conversations about defunding police, you know, and one of the things that, um, you know, came out of that is, you know, what would it look like to reallocate resources to institutions that serve our community? Um, one of the dynamics that LBS is pretty well known for um, here in Baltimore and even around the country is our critique of the way in which the nonprofit sector um, and the human social service sector has been an instrument of our oppression. And that, you know, a lot of those institutions have been financed and invested in, in the name of Black people in the ways that have done harm. Uh, and that harm isn't always described in public mainstream conversations. Um, and so this particular piece around the importance of building Black infrastructure is about what does it look like to operationalize an alternative, right? What does it look like to build the, the machinery and apparatus of our own independence and sovereignty as a people? Um, and so when we had our first conversation a couple of weeks ago, you know, we covered a lot of ground, covered a lot of territory. And, um, you know, just based on a lot of the feedback we got, you know, one of the things that we figured would make the most sense was to do several installments that focus on different areas um, as it relates to the importance of building um, the instruments of, of self-determination and independence necessary for our freedom, our collective freedom as a people. Um, so that's what tonight is. Tonight is going to be a conversation just like we had last time. Um, you know, we brought back a couple of folks that were at our first conversation and a couple of newer folks for us to zero in um, on this conversation of healing and how it relates to the importance of institution building. Um, so, so what I'll do is just give a little bit more introductory context and then I'm going to ask each of the panelists um, to kind of react to the intro um, also while they're introducing themselves and their work uh, before they launch in, uh, launch into their response. Um, if you have questions or comments, you know, feel free to comment um, in the comment section. Um, you have questions, we'll get to them kind of towards the end. Um, I'm going to cover a bunch of kind of broad big picture stuff in the beginning and then drill down based on some of the comments that we get. Um, and the last thing, just before I jump into the intro, you know, this is a comment, when we talk about healing, this is a conversation that requires a lot of vulnerability, right? And, um, you know, I think a lot of times when we see representations or hear rhetoric about revolution, one of the things that I, that I observe to be missing um, is the importance of the, the power of that vulnerability in our transformation as a community, as the roadmap to be able to look at ourselves and be our best selves. Um, you know, in my own work and in LBS's work, we focus a lot on um, what we describe as like the political warfare that's necessary, right, in order to chart a course towards liberation. We're clear that that's not the only thing, right, and that there are actually other very important aspects to our liberation um, that, that, balance, that balance all of that out. Um, and so, in many ways, this is a conversation that's not typical of what you would find in terms of LBS's work, but a conversation that's deeply a part of the network of community that we've built that we think is essential for us to collectively win. Um, and so, you know, and I, like I said, I'll model some of the vulnerability that I think is going to be necessary for us to try to course in this conversation. All right, so, so what I want to do first, um, just a little more introduction um, into this specific topic. One of the things, Danielle, you said at the last um, conversation that we had that I think a lot of people resonated with is that people are the most important institution, right? Institutions are made of a people. Um, and so people are really important as we think about institution building. Um, and so when we think about the interrelationship between, you know, building institutions and our own well-being as people, there are ways in which those things spill over into each other. Um, so one of the things that I've increasingly become, that's increasingly become apparent to me, you know, um, you know, the older I get, is that the cultural resources that come out of the bodies of work produced by people of African descent have everything we need if we tap into it. It's my observation that many of our people are socialized to disparage our cultural resources in exchange for adjacency to white people's institution institutions um, and cultural formations. Um, and so what I want to do um, is start with uh, Baba Wakesta. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your work, um, particularly on this topic, 
and react to that 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 piece that I just mentioned, this piece around, you know, peoples of African descent, you know, our culture, our bodies of work as a people, there's a tremendous amount of abundance there. Um, and again, it's been my observation that a lot of times we're socialized to not tap into it, um, and in some cases to disparage it. Um, so, you know, could you react to that, um, as some perspective of that, in addition to, you know, telling the people about you and the work you do? Certainly will. Uh, my name is Wakesa Ola Tunji Mazimoyo. I'm co-director of Aya Education Institute. Uh, we're located in Atlanta and around the world. We have been doing um, this kind of work for years and this kind of work online for 16 years, long before Zoom with Zoom. Um, uh, I love this topic because it is, is critical and essential. Um, we cannot build um, uh, strong institutions when we're not strong, okay? And part of being raised and socialized in a uh, oppressive system is that we are wounded. Sometimes the wounds come because of um, hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe. Uh, that is the daily insults, either directly and indirectly. Also, sometimes they come passed down our family line based on our family's adaptation to oppression to survive. Sometimes this adaptation uh, all, it's all times adaptation, but sometimes it's also maladaptation. What was necessary to survive in one instance may actually be hurting later on. So there's no such thing as us building institutions and us not healing if we expect to have a strong institution. If we don't, then the institution will be no stronger than our wounds and the weakest link among us. So to me, part and parcel of the building has to be healing as a built-in part of the process, as you described in terms of LDS. Uh, in terms of disparaging, excuse me, in terms of um, yeah, disparaging on our culture, uh, so to get closer proximity uh, to white goodies, uh, absolutely, that's usually the, um, uh, the ticket in order for me to get, then typically what is required is for me to uh, repudiate my culture to demonstrate that uh, I'm not someone who um, brings it in and will bring it in powerfully and or hold on to it. And part of that is necessary for me to get that. Now, some folks achieve some level of closeness um, without that. Often they don't stay as long uh, because again, that's generally the requirement uh, for it. Now on that notion and particularly as we relate to healing, one of the things that's a principle uh, at AYA in, in our program, which is called Warriors, Healers, and Builders, because those are the three things we think it takes to build an institution, that that institution and everybody in it must be skilled warriors and healers and builders. And one of the things that we say is the closer in proximity I am to uh, my oppressor, the more the onus is on me to reassure my people that while I'm close, I have not taken on their attitudes toward them, okay? So when I was doing training in Oakland uh, some years ago, uh, actually the, the brother had come from Oakland. We were in San Francisco. He'd gotten a really great job and had had it for a good while. He was lamenting the fact that in, when he went back home to his community in Oakland, people would get on his case about whether he was sold out or not and, and whatever. And I said, yo, most people who have the kind of access that you have achieved have achieved it based on repudiating our culture and taking on the oppressor's attitude. If you have not, then the onus is on you to reassure folks of that as best you can. And I get, here's another example, because that's the brother going home. In that same workshop, I was coming out going to a restaurant at lunchtime. The co-facilitator, because this is a mixed race, um, uh, what's now called equity, then it was called diversity session. And so I'm walking to this restaurant, this white blonde woman here, approaching the door about the same time I am a three sisters. Now, going through their minds, maybe, is that I have actually, in terms of my proximity, repudiated them, their beauty and their worth, for this proximity to this white woman. So what am I to do? I certainly can't do no whole workshop right there. I'm certainly not going to confessional, but I can extend. So I spoke to them first. I moved to open the door for them to show them that I, at least as in that brief moment, 
that there was not any separation between me and them. Now, whether or not they really got that or not, I don't know. It was my job to attempt to communicate it within reason. Okay, so whether we're talking about, I'm just on your point. Now, this is what's really important about that in terms of healing is we often don't take into account and we'll decide that someone, let's take the brother, telling the other brother who has this nice computer job, oh man, you know, you just, you're a sellout. Or let's assume that the sisters were wondering whether or not I had traded them in in terms of value and what and well for a white woman. Part of what, in each case, what folks are asking for, whether they do it nicely or not, is reassurance. Like the, the brother coming back from the good job and driving the car, what they're really saying is, bro, please reassure me, okay? that while you have that proximity, that you have not taken on their attitudes toward me, okay? Now, often because it doesn't come as a request, we get into a fight. Man, black folks don't want black folks to have nothing. Black folks don't want black folks to be smart, you know? It's the same thing when somebody starts to say, oh man, you sound white. The real question is, please reassure me, okay? That you haven't taken on their attitudes and, and treatment uh, toward me. If we don't get it as a request, we don't hear it as that, so we don't give the reassurance, all right? And it's gonna be really important that we do, that we understand that transaction uh, there, which is a call for reassurance, as opposed to a challenge to, to intellect. Many people will just, they're out of their mind. Black people don't like, uh, black people anti-intellectual. Are you kidding me? Black folks love black folks who know how to spit the multi-syllables, okay? We love King when he would talk about Diogenes. We love Malcolm as he wrote it down. Why? Because we knew that they were ours. I want y'all to hear this. Really important. It's about this here. We knew there was no question, in our minds at least, that Malcolm was ours. So as many multi-syllabic words he wanted to roll, we were proud of it. We, we believed that King was ours. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, and so mm -hmm. the, what, we, what is often classed as anti-intellectualism or anti-progression or whatever is really a response to what you just said. Uh, and mm -hmm. that is that typical requirement. Now, if I have been able to do that, if I've been able to maintain a proximity without selling my folks out, then it's on me to reassure a brother or a sister that that's the case. I'll stop right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, appreciate that, appreciate it. So, so what I wanna do, extending on that point, um, you know, Bakari, last time, you know, when we talked, we talked a lot about, you mentioned the importance of like imagination, right? And how a lot of times, you know, given the way that colonialism has impacted our collective consciousness, um, that it impacts our ability to be able to imagine, and I'm kind of extrapolating on what you said, so you can tell me if I'm, if I'm going too far, that a part of what happens is our imaginations are trapped within um, the kind of white colonial mindset, the limitations that we place on ourselves come as a result of our imaginations, um, you know, being, being colonized. Um, and so it impacts our ability to really um, think through the full range of our imagination, like the full range of, of our humanity. And I want to tie that into what Baba just mentioned about um, the way in which um, a lot of times when our folks are in close proximity, to white institutions, they take on the behavior of you know you know white folks in those institutions. So I would even say even further that diminishes people's imagination because there's kind of a there, there's a, a financial and survival interest there. Like if I'm going to survive in the world, then I may have to adopt some of this stuff, and so that even further diminishes people's imaginations. Um, so, so do you see a connection between those two things and, and, and you know, just kind of, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, I definitely see a connection between the two. I think when we get into those spaces, I mean, I think just speaking to the imagination piece, right? Like, I think it's limiting uh, because regardless of the scope of our imaginations, we are essentially taught, um, especially when you're socialized here, you know, in the West, like we are taught and socialized to see those white institutions as the end all be all. Um, and I remember specifically in the grant space, um, starting to um, just inquire about even attempting to apply for grants. And one of the things that someone said to me was, you know, you can't chase after the grant, you have to find the grant that fits what you're doing. 
Um, and that was something that for me kind of, it, it helped me in the best way possible, really kind of just take a step back and really evaluate whether or not that was the path that I wanted to take when I was doing organizing around Boys of Baltimore. But it was difficult, right? Because you want this money, you want the funding to be able to do the work that you're doing. But then that was the first time that I had someone say, like, you cannot try to force what it is that you're doing into this structure. You have to use the idea, take the idea that you have, outline it as best you can, and then essentially kind of shop around until you find the grant, the, you know, the, the opportunity that matches the work that you're trying to do. So I think in a lot of ways we see it, especially in institutions, I'm sure Danielle, I'm sure everybody on this, in this space knows, you know, a little bit specifically about the grant struggle, you know, that you're trying to take the expansive work that you're doing and trying to, you know, whittle it down into how X number of pages, X number of characters for that application. I think specifically in terms of how it manifests our actual creativity, for me, it was especially with organizing and looking at, uh, I felt like I wanted to, um, what did my sister says is um, overcorrection, right? In the psychology space, you're doing this overcorrection. So I had enough experience in the nonprofit sector that, you know, I didn't want to get caught up in that, um, that nonprofit industrial complex. I said, oh, well, you know, we're not going to go the nonprofit route. We're going to go the, the business route. Um, and that really created a space to have everything more top down, which I think is can can easily become uh, just as violent, right? Because then you're not we're not really talking about the cooperative governance. Um, so I think that it limits the it limits our imagination just because we see like what the model is, and if this is what the model and the structure is that works, that got the funding, that was able to take off in Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley, whatever, whichever space it is, whatever coast it is, that's kind of what we model and what we try essentially to fit ourselves into. So I think that's the, the way that I would say it's been limited, especially in a, I think that's in a business space and um, outside of business as well, nonprofit, I think there's a lot of similarities, but organizational, when it comes down to the organizational structure, we want to model what we've seen and what ultimately has, what we think and perceive as having been successful uh, so for me like getting back into that you know the Kambahi river collective like i'm like oh okay we got to do something totally different and now we're looking into spaces and trying to find ultimately all like in every manner of the word the remix right because now we got to pull from the nonprofit, we got to pull from the business we got to pull from the community like we have to pull from all of these different spaces to really kind of find a hybrid that's going to accommodate the expansiveness that we are so absolutely absolutely and so and and so so something that i think relates to that um you know danielle one of the things that you mentioned last time um was that you know people kind of look to you as somebody who you know include myself look to you as somebody that has tremendous expertise when it when it comes to like building institutions and institutional culture um particularly on, along the lines of the issues that we've discussed um and and you you said that people a lot of times see that work primarily as technical, right? So they build the technical aspects of like building an organization, building an institution. But you described it as something that is actually deeply spiritual, right? Which I think draws on a bunch of what we've talked about already. Um, so could you, you know, again, just kind of briefly introduce yourself and then elaborate on 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 that point? Sure. So um so, I mean, to answer your question, I think that uh, one, the struggle around the, the work of uh, institution building or building in general being defined as something that's highly technical, I think is not by mistake. Um, I think, as I mentioned in our last conversation, there is a real absence or inaccessibility of, of literature um, intentionally. So I think that comes from us, that explains um, our, our way historically of building anything. That means from churches and faith-based institutions to loosely formed coalitions to any of the grandest institutions. I think that if you, if we're honest about our own nation's history, um, the way that we as uh, people of African descent have always built is always rooted in spirit, but that's not something that we are often given spaces to stay. Um, I think in my own path, especially like Davon in a lot of our conversations as we've talked about this, a lot of times when, I'm, I, when, I, when I try to describe the work, I, when I'm honest, I, I, I um, share that I spend a lot of time 
and meditation and, and prayer and, 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 and kind of spaces where I'm able to pause and actually feel the work before I decide what kind of technical overlay I, is needed to make almost to, 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 to help folks believe that it, what it, whatever we're set, we've set out to do is actually possible. So in a lot of times the spreadsheets and the, the schematics and all of this kind of stuff, especially in the world of grant making and investment, usually like I already sensed or we already sensed where we need to go. Uh, but there is a, a language that we have um, been taught in this context that is necessary or we've been taught as necessary in order to convince folks of what we actually intuit. Uh, and that comes from a deeply spirit spiritual place. I also will say like, you know, the spiritual nature of this work is about acknowledging that the beginning and end of all of this work is an acknowledgement of the fact that we are all divine beings, right? And we should be treated as such. And that anything that we build should be reflective of that truth. When we take the spiritual element out of the work of building anything, we see what it yields because we have a country right now um, that uh, I think illustrates in so many different ways what it, what it means to build in systems, institutions that do harm to people and strip them away from that feeling and that sense of their, that, that connection to their divinity, right? And so I think that um, a part of it is about recognizing that, knowing that we have to constantly be in the practice of creating spaces that support folks to maintain that connection and um, move in that power. Um, it's always interesting in the space of uh, like, you know, organizational development and all of, all of these different ways that we describe the work. When working with teams and people, um, I often say, if you can connect to what spiritually feels right to folks, like if you are managing a group and if you can connect with, with that, that wellspring of um, creativity and that, that depth of, of knowledge that comes like deeply from within, you don't actually have to create all of these, these, these structures of control and accountability. Um, you know, people will drive change themselves in a very healthy way if you give them the space um, to do that in a way that is grounded in their own sense of power and divinity. So that, um, that is what I mean by, you know, the spiritual nature of this work. And I find that it's ha often hard to talk about that because of the space that I come from, right? So like when I actually try to describe the work in that way, you know, folks will want to hear like the grant maker or the investor and they'll say, I, I don't get it. I actually don't get it. So, you know, I just kind of say, save that conversation for spaces like this where it's okay. And what's interesting, if we, if we kind of follow our own path, like Davon, Shana, Bakari, as I get to know you, many of us who've come together, you see that something has brought us together in complement with each other that tells us, uh, that actually reflects what I think uh, Baba was lifting up in terms of warrior, healer, builder. You see it in our complement, and we constantly are reaching for each other, and that is for um, a really, you know, important purpose and something that I think that we need to acknowledge. When we try to lift up and often describe the actual nature of our collaboration, what happens? Folks don't even believe that we would even work mm -hmm. together, right? Because they think right. in, in this context that we should either be in competition with one another or that we are not one in the same. And so this is all about acknowledging that not only are we all a part of the same spirit, right? And guided by that same spirit, spirit we all complement in very intentional ways. Um, and so that's what I mean, um, Devon. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And that, that, and that segues really nicely, Shauna, to, um, you know, one of the things, you know, I've known you for a long time, and I've known you to be someone who studied the technologies of healing that African descended people have produced, um, and other peoples of color have produced. And, and I think when we talk about spirit, like, I think, like, we kind of know what we're talking about. But I think sometimes, you know, because of kind of Western society, there's a lot of, like, spookism that is, like, projected onto it in terms of, like, what people understand, you know, spirit to be and what it is. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I find Western society, American culture, to be fundamentally anti-spiritual, right? Which I think is a part of what makes it difficult for people to substantively understand like what, what, what we're talking about when we say spirit as something foundational. So, so could you just provide some contrast um, between like, what is it, like how has spirit showed up, shown up in societies or context 
um, again, grounded, particularly in like African descended people's bodies to work on healing. And how would you contrast that to some of the more mainstream conversations that are happening now about healing, particularly when you look at like how people are talking about self care or how people are talking about like trauma informed care? Like these are like buzzwords that have hit the mainstream. Can you contrast the two so that people who aren't as familiar have a little bit more substance as to like what we're actually talking about? Absolutely. Yeah, that was like the bomb segue. Like then y'all was talking, I was like, yep, yep. So <laughs> so that was a perfect question. I think the the when I was I was meditating on on this, knowing that we were gonna talk about it, what came up for me was the word fragmentation, right? So look, what we can be clear about when we are communing with the realities of what it, of African centered ways of knowing and then the white whitewashed wellness, white ways of knowing, there is no space for the spiritual or that which cannot be um, tangible in white space, right? Whereas everything that we do, even in the way that we might move our hand, the way that we talk, all of that is seen to be either spirit speaking through us, spirit being with us, communing with spirit, moving energy, all of the ways that we engage and exact ourselves, the way that we show up is a manifestation of, or is literally intentional and in some relationship to spirit. And so when I think about, so, so just for, for those that may be watching that don't know who I am, um, my role in community very much so is holding healing space to support um, black folks specifically um, descendants of Africans enslaved in the U.S. and from my, remembering how we've always healed. And I find that oftentimes what that looks like is it, it used to be that we would just go straight to Africa and pull it in. Um, and that's actually was my own journey, right? And I went straight to, okay, we about to go to Kemet and we about to talk about Nigeria and let me hit up the African spiritual tradition, right? And so and in my more recent development over the last five years, I've also grounded in well, like, let's talk about what our ancestors were doing when we got to this land and how they were healing. And so what becomes clear in, in the way that, sh that healing, that spirituality manifests itself or shows itself in our work is oftentimes we're not even aware that we are moving in alignment with or rhythmic to our own spiritual histories and traditions because we don't know our own history, right? Because it has been sort of separated from us. Whereas in white spaces, right, so while my work in community is holding healing space for Black women, for Black girls, for, um, for a change, at any one catalyst for change that is melanated and interested in Black liberation, and in, in my work as a, a con consultant, where I'm holding space for educational institutions, large foundations, nonprofits, health institutions, and universities, they are sort of like, well, I don't really understand. I put this one widget with this other widget and it's still not working. Like, I don't get why things aren't happening. And it, it is because it's central because they function from this concept of fragmentation. That is, listen, I put in a line item, a training for self-care. Sean Marie Brown, can you come and just teach people how to breathe so they can be all right and keep doing the work that they've been doing? right? Whereas I have to come and say, actually, no, I won't do that, right? Because central to the work that you're trying to do, you have to acknowledge the human, you have to support folks in returning the presence. So in alignment with what, um, what are you articulated, Danielle, when you were talking about, you know, if you can tap into that spirit, if you can tap into listening to yourself, then, oh, you become so much more clear, so much more aligned, so much in alignment with what our ancestors have to say, and what in nature and what, and no matter what sort of spiritual tradition we might be pulling from, we know we commune with the land, we honor the land and, and, and this sort of connectedness. But I think central to the tool of whiteness, of a uh, 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 co coloniality, um, Bakari, as you were speaking to when we're talking about imagination, I mean, they were crystal clear that if we had too much time to like be in our bodies and be with ourselves, then we will revolt. That's what our history has told us. That's how we've always healed. As if something ain't working, if you're trying to destroy us, we're going to te tear it down. So it is functional in white institutions because they fragment the things. It is that healing has no place in the workspace. Um, and, and that is something that is personal. Um, personally, even when I would hold trainings for 
um, mental health practitioners of all types. Um, I remember um, doing a training for a nonprofit um, mental health institution, and I did a training, and I, but I grounded it in healing. So I began with breath. When I could feel the energy in the room was stagnant, I made people get up and move. Um, and as folks were sharing, one of the underlying um, remnants of or examples of white fragility, right, was this um, and then after to say that I wasn't qualified to talk about what I had to do was to say, um, I didn't come here for therapy. I, current, I came here to learn the steps to help black people deal with their stuff, right? So it's utilized as a means, right? So when we're talking about what, what Baba Wakasa was talking about, right? When we're talking about this proximity to whiteness, really it is used in white institution as, can you please come help fix it? Please, please, please just fit, give me the two widgets, put it together and let's fix it. Um, and then it subsequently is used to diminish it and say, oh, no, we can't go the way that she's talking about because I don't want to feel my emotions, right? That's for at home. That's private. That's personal. And Black institutions, what we know is that, it, that, that the ways we've always communed, the way we've always established, the way our institutions were even created was around um, this witnessing and being present and being held accountable and having a system that was rooted in spirituality. Yeah. So, you know, you know, what's interesting, you know, I mean, I think the, the alignment and a lot of what is said is pretty natural. And, you know, what it make what it makes me think about, um, you know, because I think one of the things that that I think I see in a lot of folks who are struggling to do the work, like when you're particularly, you know, if you do work, it's like social justice or work. It's about like, you know, helping black folks. Um, you know, I think people go through a lot of like internal stuff. Like there's a bunch of internal stuff that I think, um, I, I don't know that I experienced both in my early adulthood and as I, you know, get a little older, like, I don't know that I've experienced very many spaces that were very intentional about people kind of processing like some of their stuff and then how it shows up in the way, you know, that folks do work. I mean, I, I you know, kind of use myself as an example you know, like, you know, I'm somebody that, you know, I don't come from a family with a lot of means, right, or, you know, political, substantial economic connections or whatever. And, you know, I remember I went to, I went to a magnet middle school in Baltimore County. And, you know, so it was, it was pretty racially mixed, but it was mostly white. And I remember being in middle school. And I remember all of a sudden, I just stopped caring about school. And, you know, and, and I remember, you know, my parents were upset and frustrated, obviously. And, and I remember thinking to not having the language to explain, like, I just know this is bullshit. Like, I just know <laughs> it is, right? But I don't have the language, right? Yeah. And so, and it was interesting because even though my grades were bad, my standardized test scores were pretty good. So I was able for ninth grade, I got into a magnet high school in Baltimore County, um, you know, in ninth grade, and I got kicked out. And I ended up at Forest Park. And I remember like the, my entire year, my, my ninth grade year, I remember just being deeply depressed, right? Like just didn't want to exist, right? And I remember there was a moment when, and again, you know, coming from an environment where there wasn't a whole lot of space for people to have the language to understand all the stuff that you all have talked about. And so I remember there was a moment when I had to say to myself, like, I got to lift myself out of this somehow, right? And I made some commitments to myself to say, you know what, I'm going to, you know, how much worse could it be to lift myself out of it? And one of the things that I've seen that translate into is, is that, you know, even the way that I was trained politically and intellectually, you know, like, I have, I, I remember there were times where I've had very little patience for conversations about people's stuff. You know, like just very little patience with like, this is hard or, you know, this makes me feel sad. Um, you know, I don't feel enough. Right. Like, I, you know, I see a lot on the Internet when people are talking about like, I am enough I, and I get it. But I have a hard time relating to it because the way that I feel like I experienced large parts of my life is like, get over it. Like, do what you got to do, you know, and I've had to learn to be more gentle, both with myself and others. Mm -hmm. you know, in light of the fact that that was my experience. So I imagine when we talk about people who take on the attitude of the oppressor, 
I imagine that's one aspect of it, right? Where you lose the ability to show sympathy and to show a level of understanding of like how harmful and hurtful it is to have those experiences and people just have different reactions to them. You know what I mean? Um, you look like you was going to say something, Shana? I was just going to say, I mean, the other reality is that most of us, because most of us as folks of African descent, unless we have been cultivated in a family that has provided us with the tools to be able to commune with the realities of big emotion, to understand what, what they are, I think the, the, this, the, I don't have time for it, get over it, like just move on, is all often manifest as a, I'm stuffing it, right? So we, we see this in, in our people. I mean, we see it in all people, but I don't, I'm in concern with black people. Okay, we see it in, in us as it manifests in, in physical dis-ease and we think that it's completely separate, right? And so, yeah, don't, don't nobody got time for it because we don't have the, we haven't been taught or we can't remember the resource on how to hold it but also that it's so much to hold the concept of individualism that is injected into us as a tool of whiteness, fragmentation, and separation, and, um, and decomposition is, it makes it such that you couldn't hold it by yourself. Like oftentimes we are, you know, you might see things on, on Facebook or social media, or even in our spaces where it's like, oh, I got to stay away because this, me, this one person, I don't have the capacity for it. And, and that helps us to remember, well, how did Black people always heal, right? It certainly wasn't just one-on-one. -on -one. And if it was one-on-one, -on -one, it was someone that was endowed, that was sent for, that had the emotional, spiritual capacity, the gift to be able to hold it because they weren't holding it alone. It was with ancestral energy, with the uh, insight of the Orisha or, or any other sort of entity uh, of this sort of greater existence and way of knowing. So yes, it's a tool of whiteness and that's exact. And, and we know white people don't have the capacity to deal even with, you know, just being acknowledging that they are racist, right? Like, you know, so certainly we use it, but I think we have the ability to, to gain, regain capacity um, for our own witnessing of ourselves and, and each other. Yeah, I just like wanted to, go ahead, okay. Daniel. I just want to jump in and, and, and support that and say, and, and that has to be done in community um, because it takes a collective effort to, some, to, to not only shift our way of being, but then also to hold ourselves accountable and be supported in a way that we can sustain that over time. Um, Davon, I just wanted to add that not only like is your the experience one I want to thank you for sharing that experience and opening it up because I think it gives us all permission to like really speak honestly about um, how we've all experienced in some stage of life I think what you were describing and I would like to add to that like that the element of education how we're educated how we're trained how we're groomed to think about notions of success and uh, and what is often uh, applauded in this um, kind of social, the social context means that we're often driven away from what actually makes us feel, feel good. I remember like a few, maybe a few years out of college, um, me and all my like, you know, friends, there was this one point, I remember one year where we all just were like, girl, what, women, what is going on? Like, we are all tired. We don't feel good. You know, for, like, I, I feel like everybody is uh, applauding, like, all of these things that I have going on, but this doesn't quite feel like what I want to do, what I should be doing. And um, as I, you know, you, when you talk about that, that experience of, like, even collectively coming to that place of being like, wait a minute, something is not right, especially as Black women, right, when you think about how, like, that kind of notion of the workhorse, for example, like, productivity, like, continue to grind, like, you know, the self, like, the notion of selfless that puts everything above and uh, it uh, above your own needs right like really intentionally drives you away from um you know actually being able to center the things that we need to to feel whole so i just want to add like you know that notion of like education training career you know and what that also means in terms of this conversation which is often a difficult one um and i'll, I'll pause there because i know baba is also trying to get in that's wonderful. I actually am loving uh, listening and learning. Uh, there's no success without succession. So y'all make me happy. <laughs> okay. Um, and your power and expertise. Um, so I just really want to say that I, I agree everything with everything that you, you uh, said. 
Uh, one of the things that I'm also just looking at is a couple of comments in the, in the, in the section here. I do want to segue because what you were saying about spirit is just so important and what you're saying about collective and not doing this by ourselves. I relate that to the first comment uh, that Devon started with. And as, instead of repudiating our culture, if we go there, we will actually find what we need. For example, uh, while many of us, myself included, decided that Christianity wasn't the path, what we sometimes missed is that our churches in this process weren't Christian. In the theology, they were Christian, but not in the process, okay? All right, I grew up in a holiness church, okay? And you went to church for community, all right? Also, Wednesday night prayer meeting was for you to grieve. You, you cried, right? And you weren't just crying because of somebody died on the cross, okay? As oppressed people, we're going to have losses. So we created mechanisms, okay, for us to cry and grieve collectively and go through that and become stronger because we were a collective and a whole. The whole notion of call and response, okay, which is, if you really understand the spirit of it, right, it is I am because we are and we are because I am. When the choir gets up in the, in the uh, pulpit, behind the pulpit, and starts belting out this song, and the sister in the back row feels the spirit and gets up and takes the song away from the choir. Now, in any white institution, of course, they're going to be offended or blah, blah, blah. Are they, is, is our choir offended? No. In fact, they are inspired because her response becomes a call. Then the, the choir goes higher, and they start doing stuff they didn't even know they were going to do. You can trade, I say choir, but you can say, I say hey, you say ho, or you can do drumming and dancing. The key is this kind of call and response is uh, emblematic of the kind of community that you were talking about, where we heal and we be in community. Now, often when we start building businesses and building organizations, we don't bring that in, okay? It's, it's, it's tangential, it's whatever. No, it really needs to be central to how we build and how we communicate. Because again, this is the same holding the church. It's got a cross up there and it's got theology, right? But it ain't the same church, okay? Um, and so that's an important part. Now, I want to say that just in terms of segue. And also to get to, there's a comment about, uh, I think that came off of um, uh, Bakari's talking about the Kambahi, um, Kambahi uh, River Collective. Uh, it said, we need to revive the cooperative model of institution building, cooperatively run and owned, but it takes time and centers relationship in our transaction. Now, this is, is absolutely critical. And part of what's important is for us to, let me just tell you the story of uh, 2008, when you had the so-called um, mortgage crash and all of that. Um, what we had is, uh, Afia, Mama Fia in my home uh, was caught up in that. We were underwater. Uh, they devalued our home. So now we owe $60,000 more than it's worth and whatever. And so we started fighting that in court. Because that's the war. We always do things in three parts. That's the worry part. We also start healing and building because we formed an Isusu. Uh, and Isusu is a collective. It's like a hand club. And you have 10 people or 20 people. And, you know, if the, if the kitty is $100, then everybody brings $100. And Devon gets it this month. And Danielle gets it the next month. All right, in that kind of way. What we knew, we were doing this to buy homes. So people were putting in 500 a month and we bank it and for every three, and then every three months, you know, Bakar would get the hand, uh, Danielle would get the hand and whatever. And we'd go and buy homes because they depressed the market. So the homes that we lived in, now we were thrown out of and they were cheap. But of course we couldn't get the loans to go and scoop up those. So we became our, sought out to become our own bank. Now, in order to be a part of this, you had to go to our three-day retreat that we call Warriors, Healers, and Builders, also sometimes called Healing Oppression's Womb, to get to some of what we had internalized, excuse me, what had been injected in us based on uh, trusting or not trusting Black people with money. 
So we, we, we create a safe place where people could bring up what they caught from Big Mama Nim. Okay? We ask, for example, do you recall your family ever owing a black person a large sum of money? Hmm. Okay. What did your grandmama, granddaddy, mama, daddy say, you know, whenever the car didn't work after going to a black mechanic? Okay. What did they say after? To bring up um, programming, both that would come through television and socialization, and also programming that would come through uh, when mama was talking and dad was talking and whatever. So that we could say, we want to replace that with something else. And part of a, a skill is how do we build trust where distrust is induced? Oppression induces me, first, not to trust me because I'm a thug and I'm not disciplined and all of that. All of that programming has me not trust me. And I'm afraid if I'm going to keep up my part. And then it sure enough has me distrust you, okay, with my money or anything of value. What means is even if we kind of get all and we, we, we all are one particular group or one particular philosophy, the first time there's a bump, then all of those, that old programming comes and says, oh no, see, Devon, oh, whatever. And what's missing is how to stay present with Devon, okay? How to account for what was going on, all right, uh, there, and the tool set. And so it's important as a skill, I mean, that we gain the skill of how do we build trust among us intentionally where distrust induced instead of being so shocked that Danielle may distrust me that I want to become skilled at how do I get Danielle's trust how do I earn her trust at deeper and deeper levels as opposed to I'm appalled that you don't trust me and that's what's wrong with black people because we don't trust each other how do I how skilled am I at building trust and knitting trust where oppression has induced it. And, and uh, approaching that with joy, approaching that with opportunity, because underneath this Isusu, that was the real goal. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we, people said, well, this is wonderful what y'all are doing. Now what you ought to do is all of y'all ought to buy the houses in the same block, so then you control the block. And we said, not yet. And they're like, what? I said, it makes good logical sense. It makes good transactional sense. But we're, we're just beginning to trust us. So we don't want to put on top of that beginning, you must have it here, who you must have it here. So people can choose whatever houses they want and wherever. All right. um, people also, a skill is for us to become emotionally authentic. Now, this society programmed me and all of us to be emotionally inauthentic. That's what white folks run on, okay? You, you, if, in fact, if you try to become be authentic in a white corporate place, you call a country bumpkin. Okay, you're supposed to have something that's for the public consumption, and then your real self that nobody knows. Okay, authenticity is not that's 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 for fools in their system. On the other hand, the kind of spirit that Daniel is talking about, it really comes from building trust and having that kind of trust. So you don't have to have controls after controls because we got trust. Well, we have trust, we don't have to have control. She hit it right on the head. The question is, how, what's the skill to do that? And so one of those skills is to become emotionally literate and emotionally authentic, particularly because I've been socialized to not know and to substitute one feeling. Some of you may know the work of psychologist Amos Wilson. Powerful work, one of the things he talked about is one of his great small books is the falsification of African consciousness. What we have been operating on and, and have our classes based on also, in addition to the falsification of our consciousness, is the falsification of our learned emotional responses. Let me try to give you a short example. Let's go back to, I'm like uh, Devon and I'm in middle school and I'm in uh, North Carolina because I went back and forth. My mom and dad were separated. And so sometimes I'm in New York City and sometimes I'm in North Carolina, depending on which parent I stayed with, you know? And it was cool in terms of emotional because they both loved me and I can go with the one of them. The point is I'm in school and there's this wonderful sister named Judy that I kind of got a liking for. <clears throat> and she, she, her family is a little bit crust above. They make more money than, than my family does. 
So I'm a little got a little trepidation, brother Devon, you know, but I'm trying to get up enough nerve to ask Judy for her phone number. And I do. And she said, So when I when she does that, when she rejects me, doesn't give me a phone number and doesn't act like she's sad about it, not giving me her phone number. What I've been socialized to feel is angry. Bump you then. I didn't want your phone number in the first place. Blah, blah, blah. And we're raised to believe that that substitution is natural. Okay. And I do workshops all over town, all over the country. And, and, and everywhere I go, when I role play that, I'll pick somebody out of the audience and they know how to role play it to a T. Okay. That is. So I am mad with the sister and don't let no brothers be in earshot. Because it goes from, you know, I didn't want it no way to I start throwing some B words around. All right. Because what I've been socialized to do is to not show sad or scared. The real deal is I'm sad. I wanted chocolate. I got vanilla. I wanted her number. Okay. I got nothing. I, I had all kind of imaginations, you know, about what it would be if I had her number and, I, and we were beginning to make something. What people would think about me, what and whatever, right? The, the point is that pattern, that feeling mad when I'm actually sad or scared is a falsified emotional response. Now, grandmamas know it. You know, you stumping, you eight or nine, you stumping because you didn't get something. She said, well, come over here, boy, and give you a hug, okay? That is intuitively, we know that that's a substitution. This society, that's a dynamic substitution, all right? And I don't even know it myself. If you gave me a lie detector test while I'm spewing out the words toward Judy, that she ain't nothing, I ain't want to know where I would pass the lie detector test because I'm convinced. Now that's a falsified response. Now, when I do that and I flip it around and I have people role play it, and instead of me substituting anger for sadness, if I just say, you know what? I got to tell you, Judy, that messed me up. Because I had all kinds of dreams about us making some wonderful music together. And I hear you, I respect your right, you know, to, you know, not give me a number. But I got to tell you, that messes me up. So maybe you think about it, maybe another time. See it. Now, I'm not groveling on the floor. I'm not whatever. What we will say is the first one is natural. No, the first one is how white folks do it and how we've learned to do it. So we say that's natural, okay? I'm no less a powerful person, no less a man, no less of whatever, that I accepted that she didn't do it and I was aware of my sadness. This particular substitution pattern is a dominant substitution pattern from white folks to men because they are always at war. Y'all hear me, if we're gonna talk about black people working together and building organizations, we gotta know how their culture has been injected in us and how it comes out as we are communicating and touching each other. And so the, theirs is this particular pattern that I demonstrated with Judy is appropriate when I'm at war. It is not appropriate when I'm trying to make community and I'm trying to build trust and I'm trying to build an organization. If there's a war, then you, you, you and me big, uh, let's say best buddies, right? And folks are shooting at us. I, and I'm your best friend and the best sharpshooter and I'm taken out. You may feel sad, Devon, but you're not going to no funeral at that point because the bullets are still flying, all right? You may feel a little bit scared because I was the best sharpshooter, but you're not going to show your enemy scared. It's appropriate when you're at war, when we use it, when we're not at war, we make war, okay? Now, you can change that sister with Judy with, well, the decisions that I've been looking and the last three decisions with the way of the people who got degrees. Or the last three decisions with the way of the, you can fill in the blanks, whichever it bears, boom. And I'm sad or scared about it when I don't have the language to say, hold up. Um, you know, I've been in many different organizations and and I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit scared that uh, as sisters, we're going to be discounted because the last three decisions have gone this way. And I just want us to check it out. I'm not prepared to say it absolutely is that. I want us to check it out. And if we brothers said, 
Well, let's check it out. Let's just review it. Just that in of itself has a system, all right? Or the person that don't have no degrees by the name. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I want you to understand I'm trying to show you the process. The variables can change, okay? But the process of oppression has it so that it directs our communication to conflict. And we often don't know what to do with it, so we want to suppress it. Don't be bringing none of that stuff up in here. That's just dividing us. And that mm -hmm. re reflects that we don't have the skill set. So we need an emotional skill set, okay? Uh, that includes mad, sad, scared, joyful, peaceful, and powerful. I'm not about no, no folk, no skill set that don't have no permission for me to be pissed off, okay? I just don't want it to be I'm sad and I'm showing pissed off, okay? That is, that is, I'm, I'm, we need to be, all, that's what I mean by authentic. Now I'm giving you the short version. But one of the skill sets is that we become emotionally authentic as opposed to emotionally guided by the, the script provided by white folks. I'll stop right there. So, so, so what I want to do, and that's, that's actually an excellent segue. Um, so there are a couple of like general questions um, that I want to put to the group that relates, I think, to specific dynamics that relate to, to, to Bob, what you just kind of laid out, and just interested in getting people's, people's thoughts on this. And so there's really, there are really two, two questions. Um, so for this, for, the, for this first one, let me just give some context. Um, so, so two things that kind of go hand in hand. Um, I think it's clear, you know, folks that are watching this and kind of this group here, we're clear um, that for Black people to be free, um, it's going to take our most rigorous practitioners in a variety of arenas in society to be able to get it done, right? Um, you know, our, our freedom is not going to be won um, by chastising white people to be fair. It's not going to be won by cajoling white people to recognize our humanity. Um, that as a community, we got to be clear that what has been done to people of African descent was an undeclared act of war, um, you know, against our community. Um, and so it makes me think of, for instance, you know, for me, one of the my, my favorite examples of this, and I know Baba Wakasa, you'll you'll love this, is um, the 1974 UNESCO conference in Cairo, right, where Sheikh Anta Diop and Teofelo Benga, two African Egyptologists, did intellectual warfare with European Egyptologists, and everybody knew who was going to that conference. Everybody knew that conference was going to be about the race of the ancient Egyptians, and Obinga and Diop didn't go to the conference asking white people, please stop being mean, you know, please acknowledge us. Diop was, and Obinga were superior intellectually, right? And it was that conference that, um, you know, really in many respects made illegitimate this idea that the ancient Egyptians were white, mm -hmm. right? So it was, it was intellectual warfare against those who are maintaining the status quo and it required superior preparation. In conjunction with that, though, we have the societal propaganda of notions of Black inferiority, right? Mm -hmm. And that societal propaganda, it creates this, this environment where I think many of our people have a hard time thinking that it's even possible for Black folks to engage in that kind of intellectual warfare. Because I think many of us have been programmed to not even see ourselves, right, as, as having the capacity for doing that. So, so a part of what I want to get to is that I think one of the things that I've heard people, this phrase, I've heard people describe imposter syndrome, right? Where it's like, I don't feel like I'm the real thing. And a part of that is because when people hold you to very high rigorous standards, some of the, and this goes to what Bible what Kessa was saying about some of the scripts that were taught is, oh, you're saying I'm not good enough as a human being, right? as opposed to, you know, holding people accountable to kind of be their best selves. So, so my question is really about this notion of imposter syndrome and what I see is like that, that, that tightrope of wanting to demand the best of our people mm -hmm. while also knowing that notions of black inferiority have, a, have spiritually and emotionally scarred us to the point where I think instead of confronting the, inter the, the kind of injected oppression that, that we face, it's easier um, to, to kind of cast people that hold you accountable or cast people that want you to do better as hating on you, right? You know, as people who they just want to bring you down, right? 
Um, and I typically find this in like, particularly in white dominated spaces, right? Where, you know, black people appeal to white people's sympathies as opposed to, I'm just gonna be better, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so, you know, what, what do folks think about, about that breakdown? Because I, I know that was a lot, but I feel like, you know, particularly as we talk about institution building, like we're gonna need our best. Like this isn't something where, you know, I'm because I'm not a person that like give a sticker to everybody for participation. You know what I'm saying? It's like we gotta be, we gotta demand people be our best selves. But how do we do that in a way where we're actually dealing with the fact that people have a hard time with that? There's some people who their belief in themselves has been severely compromised and may have a hard time, um, you know, with those levels of, of standards. I, I'll start with you, Bakar. Man. Oh, well, did you say so, me? Oh, Bacar. Good, thank you. Bacar, yeah. So I, I guess for me, for starters, I wanted to say I think it's really like how we, how we have to reframe it. This conversation has just been, this is a bomb, okay? This is a bomb right here. Um, but for me, it's really about imposter syndrome versus cultural displacement. Um, and so you shared a little bit about, you know, your upbringing, your middle school journey. For me was raised primarily by a single mother. And because of the times that we moved to being a middle child, right? We already middle child, we got some of those, those tropes and traumas that come along with that. But because of the specific year and the time that we moved, um, I ended up going to two elementary schools, one middle school, and then two high schools. So for me throughout that time where most people, um, and then context wise, we moved from Marble Hall to Pikesville. Um, so you're talking about culture shock for people that are in Baltimore, around Baltimore. Um, that was super culture shock, right? We went from having a bathroom buddy to go to the restroom to kind of stand in front of the door so that nobody could see you using the bathroom and that perhaps so that you would not be uh, abducted and perhaps sex traffic out of a black neighborhood, out of a black school into a completely white neighborhood where it was difficult for me to pronounce the names of my, of my teachers, right? Because they had Jewish heritage. Um, the saving grace, which I think is ironic and right on point with this conversation is that I ended up going to the same Baptist church throughout that entire trajectory, right? So, um, we know that we have a, a complicated, Nate, like a complicated relationship with the black church for, for multiple reasons. But as Baba Wakesa said, we weren't, we're not just, we're not just, you know, in here crying about white Jesus, right? We know that there's more that's going on. It's more that's taking place than what is on the surface, whether we realize it consciously or not, there's more that's, that's, that's taking place. So um, one for me, I have to just lift up that, you know, my gratitude for being able to be cultivated in that space, um, in, that, in that pot, because for me, it was not just the grieving and the crying, but it was also a space of like grooming and growing. And for me, context-wise, it's critical because I wasn't able to realize that until I, I, had, I was further away from that space where I realized that Oh, like I was, you know, and I, a lot of us, I'm sure in this space, either we were that person or we know that person. Um, I didn't realize until literally last week, um, my friend uh, Oshun uh, introduced me to the term specifically brain drain, right? Where this um, idea of this individual, um, this special, this token, tokenized black person, you're doing really good in your standardized test, Davon, as you mentioned, we're gonna strip you from the people that look like you, we're gonna displace you here, um, and then you're going to continue to matriculate through school with this intellectual capacity, but none of the cultural capacity to then continue to, to engage with your people. So for me, it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm 34 and I'm just, you know, starting to come into just, just being introduced to the language to even be able to recognize the act of war that that is, right? Because if it is intellectual warfare, then brain drain is just the mechanism that it happens, right? So if we need that the most rigorous practitioners, but the most rigorous practitioners among us have no cultural competency and no way of communicating with the people that we got to go to war with, right? Then we just, we spinning our wheels. So it's a couple of things that for me, I just wrote down um, specifically reflection, reconciliation and reintroduction because somebody in the comments wrote, uh, what do you all think we have to do to push past the fear many have to create, invest in and stick with our own institutions instead of trying to fix systems that were never designed to serve us. And so for me, that uh, reflection, you know, pairs and is in tandem with self-awareness, that reconciliation is in some capacity, that acceptance. So I had to just accept, right, that I was a victim of, of brain drain and that 
um, I probably would have been intellectually more capable and adept at, at both communicate with myself and people that look like me if I had perhaps been an autodidact and been allowed to stay in spaces with people that look like me. And then that reintroduction, right? And that, for me, recognizing that it's going to mean a certain level of forgiveness for the ways and the time that I spent thinking that this proximity to whiteness was the path, right? Peace. Um, Peace. So we, Peace. we just, we talked on... <laughs> A lot of different things, but for me, I think we have to reframe it, right? And I think I'm glad that you said imposter syndrome. I'm glad we introduced it into the space, and specifically for Black women and Black femmes, I think don't really have a lot of space to to mess up, right? So imposter syndrome, in some capacities, is Black women, specifically Black feminine folks, understanding that there's a knowledge gap, and then other times, it's not imposter syndrome. It's just a matter of that confidence. So I think we say imposter syndrome, most of the time people mean it in that, do I have the confidence, right? I feel like an imposter, even though I'm more credentialed than Karen whole time. I'm more credentialed than her off rip. So um, I just want to introduce into the space that conversation about imposter syndrome versus cultural displacement. Maybe it's not verse, but maybe it's both and all in, all in tandem. Beautiful. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to say something, Sean? Or oh, Dan, 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 Dan. <laughs> I mean, either way, right. both of us are just like everything right, right. Sorry said. <laughs> but um, okay, go ahead, Shauna. You want to go, and I'll go after you. No, okay, okay. So I'll just add another um, another element to it, which is uh, just redefining what it means to be excellent. And by excellent, I don't mean perfect. I don't mean not you know failing or trying and trying again. I don't mean like working yourself until you're killing yourself. That's not what I mean by excellent, but I mean excellent in how it should be reflected in our own community. The reason why I raise that is because um, kind of, you know, related to what Bakari was talking about in terms of cultural di displacement, we also have this dynamic where there are certain folks that are elevated for being excellent, uh, you know, as representatives of our community that are not necessarily excellent or not necessarily trying that hard and not necessarily studying or not necessarily preparing you know or not necessarily doing the work of uh and i mean the work of representing us um uh to the fullest degree right and i think when we're honest and this goes back to baba's uh, point about authenticity i think when we're truly authentic in this conversation we have to recognize that who is elevated at what time by whom is 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 often intentional and serves an agenda um, that is not necessarily meant to serve us. So when we um, even think about what's happening among our peer group um, often, and I mean I think it gets, gets complicated in this this age of social media where you can like post a picture and think like look like you are down, <laughs> like post an article and look like you and not even read it. Like you know what I mean? This is what we're dealing with, and so you can create these optics and these perceptions. Uh, this perception of um, being on it when you're not and being celebrated for that when you're not true, not real. And we, we, I think we see the difference, but we've got to hold ourselves accountable to actually calling that out in a loving way, in a respective way, in a way that helps folks to get back on that path of self-awareness, collective aw awareness, and healing, you know, because it definitely serves an agenda. Like, I will, I will share that I've, um, I've been in rooms where there was an intentional dis discussion about, and, and I wasn't necessarily a participant. I was, like, young and just there to take the notes, right? But just listening to the conversations that happen around who are we going to um, nominate for that award? You know, leader one, leader number two. Well, we don't want to do leader number two because think about how that's going to play out. We don't want folks to get like too, you know, you know what I mean? Like that kind of that conversation and everything, like all the subscript. And so then leader number one gets elevated because they're non-threatening, right? Like they're not going to challenge um, like the dominant kind of school of thought or what folks are trying to protect, right? So you elevate the alternative, the person who is non-threatening, not going to push the bounds, not going to like not going to hold folks accountable. Um, to what they should be doing by us, um, and 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 yet that what happens with person number one is that they become very invested in that system and start to defend um, that position, right? And that is hard, you know. We we see that play out all the time, and sometimes we we shift positions, right? Like I'm, I don't present this dynamic in a way that suggests like any of us on this call couldn't be elevated at one particular point. But when we see this pattern of folks being celebrated for mediocrity 
And when we see the, the, uh, the impact that it is having on us as a people, like we need to be honest about that and we need to shift that tide. Um, and so, you know, that's just one thing I'll offer. Yes. Mo okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do, I, I really want to uh, amplify. Okay, there's so much. Wait, let me go to my notes. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, I was taking notes though. So um, when Danielle was talking about the importance of us being really clear around defining excellence or, or decolonizing success, I think the other thing is that we don't talk about, like we, I mean, I mean, like the people, like not enough of us in public talk about what excellence actually looks like and why and whose feet we were sitting at and what, what history shows us so that folks can reassess and re reassert ourselves. Oftentimes when the conversation around imposter syndrome comes up, and so myself being trained as a clinical social worker and then working as an integrated psychotherapist, I'm often in the spaces where it's like, okay, I'm in one space and it's a whole bunch of white social workers, and then I'm in another space and there's a whole bunch of black social workers, but everybody's still talking like they're white social workers. But because we black and we study cultural competence, like it's, it's what's up. And so I think it's really important for us to for, to more to more clearly and succinctly amplify the difference between um, imposter syndrome being you are excellent, you are in a space where you know you're in a, you're working in, in white institution, right, and you are not utilizing your skill for black folks. So I think one of them, I think, and, and, and there, was, there was also this question about like talking about entrepreneurship and, and that being important. But I also think that it's important in alignment with this conversation for us to uplift the reality that everybody isn't supposed to be the leader. Like some of us are like, so like, and, and, and the need for us to reconfigure what leadership looks like within our institutions is so much. So when we're talking about um, if you if your role is to be in white institution, but are you are you also supporting the work that's actually supposed to be done? Where everybody don't need to know what it is you're doing. Perhaps you do need to not be vulnerable in that space so that you can maintain that position while you feed in the movement. Likewise, those of us that are called to, supposed to have the skill set to, the fortification, and are ready to cultivate or hold down a black institution, to fortif for us to do the fortification and the healing necessary to be able to lead in a way that is anti-white, that is pro-black, that is in alignment. I had a personal experience where you know I I call myself sort of leading and and um, really amplifying what I know to be true and pro-blackness, what I know it to be true and being spiritually grounded, um, where I haven't seen it modeled um, and shared with me from, from my elders, right? But trying to take the information that I have and create it, where I was literally told, oh, but this doesn't feel like real work because you're not doing it the way white people do it. So, so that's one thing that I think is really important for us to articulate is that in the event we are creating an institution and we're doing it differently, the healing part is necessary for us to not, uh, for our folks in, in our community not to uh, embody anti-Blackness by diminishing that which is grounded and rooted on what it means to function from an African-centered perspective. But the other thing is oftentimes many of us are, we're imposter syndrome, because we know that we're not supposed to be in these janky ass institutions. I, I, like I used to work in a local department of social services. I was doing sex abuse investigations. I can't, and, and I was going above and beyond in all of my writings, right? But I also felt that I couldn't say exactly what it is I needed to say about the racism within the institution, about how we were, you know, uh, establishing and upholding um, um, these systems of white supremacy in our, our treatment of our children or in working in residential treatment centers, knowing that it's really like our children in cages all over again. We're not going to get on that. But like the imposter syndrome there, like if I were to say I feel like I don't belong here, is sometimes misconstrued to mean, 
um, and being imposter syndrome, that's the language that I'm using because it is what white folks say, oh, you're experiencing imposter syndrome. Oh, trust me, you're excellence, you do belong here. When it's like, actually, no, that's something else. That's what, what we're talking about when we're talking, what was the word, Bakari, hold on. Cultural displacement. Thank you, all right, <laughs> that, that's cultural mm -hmm. displacement. <laughs> that's cultural displacement where it was it was that I had to come to an understanding that no I don't belong in this white institution that's not I don't I, I know how to navigate it I don't want to it makes me sick I'm supposed to do something else um, versus someone saying versus us redefining excellence and so just to sort of begin our conversation about what excellence would mean within this framework I really think that um, so Kalila said the other challenge is some people are in fact imposters. They haven't been cultivated in the liber liberator tradition and or have been elevated so quickly they haven't actu actually acquired expertise. And so that's exactly what I was about to touch on, right? Is for one, for us to talk about those of us that are, that have been cultivated in a liberator tradition, for us to talk about it, for us to identify spaces and create the institutions to continue that work, and for us to be able to talk explicitly about that. And so my personal experience, you know, I remember being in a sister circle with my godmother, Latava Mabili Django, and a couple of my sisters doing, in the, the few months of, the beginning months of my year-long rites of passage process, where I'm crying because they like, girl, you's not doing what you're supposed to do. I don't, mm, they was calling me to excellence. Like, we know that you are supposed to do better. You, why won't you leave this institution? And I'm like, well, I'm crying because I don't think that I can do it. I don't feel right. And, and what had to happen was I needed to hear my elder mama say to me and to my God sisters in circle. So this was pr a private space, not public. Um, listen, when they said to my sisters, when your God sister get herself together, she's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Y'all just wait. We just going to have to work on these few things. We had to hold the space for healing in these few ways. And your responsibility as her God sister is to do this, this, and this, and this throughout this rites of passage process so she can move through it. Likewise, I had an elder, and my elder, my, my godmother is, was holding the space for me to undo, to de reconstruct, to identify identify to illuminate the, the skill set that I had. And then once I had that fortification of parenting that I was not provided in the same way because of histories of, of, of and, and uh, intergenerational traumas, I was able to bring about that, that, that divine support and mothering that I needed so that I could say and say, be trained in and call on and acknowledge the training that I got and what it means to fortify institution what does the what does the what does our history say what does it look like to truly be about liberation because we it's important for us to recognize that freedom is individual liberation it it, it does require a level of warfare and, and we need to get ready and what does that mean and what's the the not so fancy stuff that we're not about to talk about on facebook because that needs to go on like, offline and what's the stuff that we really need to make clear like are you establishing a relationship and community for real or are you just doing this so that you can go and get the coin from over here said white institution over here are you actually about this work are like what like are you showing up as your authentic self like like do you know how to work with people that you don't like, but you love? Like, do you understand what that means? Are you willing to struggle with it as opposed to piecing out real quick? Because that's, that's the, th those experiences that I've had personally, it really left me as a person that has been uh, oriented in this tradition to be like, I don't want to be nobody's supervisor. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to recreate the whiteness. I don't know if I want nobody on my team. Because um, folks be hurting my feelings out here. They be like, oh, you doing that black stuff? I don't know. I'm going to go back over here to this white institution because I, I like it the way it feels here. I like it's more comfortable to fragment. It's easier to do that because nobody's seeing my shit. I'm not required to do the healing work. And so I think, I think it's important for us to uplift what it means to be a liberator, uh, being cultivated in a liberator tradition. And Davon, the last thing I'll say um, there were a few years ago, you came, I was holding space for some young people around cultivating and establishing uh, understanding around working within pu the public sector. And you did an, a, a magnificent 
job of concretizing that which I knew, but I don't think had been art uh, articulated so so succinctly. You you real good at that. Um, you you made a chart where you wrote out your lineage, your your lineage, who cultivated you, and you were able to articulate why it was important for that, why is it, it was important for folks to be able to answer those questions, to question the orientation that they were um, cultivated under. So yeah, you know, I, I might get into all the white spaces because I went to university so-and-so and I'm in so-and-so's whitewash doctorate program or whatever. Yeah, and I said it and they probably watching and it's fine because we all clear because I'm the same person every fucking way. But I can also say that Sister Latava Mabili Django is, is the one who really held the space for me and that I'm, 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 I'm sitting at the feet of Manifest Ra who's teaching me how this looks and as so-and-so grandma over here like it's important for us to know that the, the, the curriculum vitae of the resume ain't enough for us to get clarity around what it means to be excellent when we're talking about working for black liberation. So Bob I'm gonna come back to you I want to add a few things to it um, <laughs> you know because I think <laughs> Because I think, I mean, especially what you broke down earlier, I think really open up the space for us to go even deeper. Um, and let me actually, I'm, I want to put a bow on something that, um, or add to something that Bakari said earlier about the cultural displacement piece. Because um, as I mentioned, kind of when I talked about my experience, when I went to Forest Park, that was actually one of the best things that happened to me. Because even though it's academically much less of, you know, people would call it a less rigorous space it gave me a space to discover something that would be a fundamental part of my cultivation and development um, in a way that I was free from all of the kind of cultural toxicity of white spaces. Um, and I was fortunate enough that, um, you know, because even though I was the guy on the debate team, also because of my experiences of the other places I was at, I was more grounded just with my, my own people. So it wasn't one of those things where like I was a smart guy and I just walked around like I was better than everybody. It was like, I'm one of the debate team and you know, he, Davon is Davon. And I, and I had people who looked out for me, like people who, you know, they might've been hustling. It was like, yeah, Davon's cool, leave him alone. He gonna go do something, you know, leave him alone. And that's been, that was my experience, right? And I don't think that people talk enough about those kind of experiences where there was like tremendous, like there was protection I got from my own community in ways that wasn't necessarily spoken of um, that I, that for me is foundational to who I've been able to become. You know, I easily could have went somewhere else and become one of those people that looked down on my community. But the fact that people made sure I was fine, like I never felt like I was unsafe. You know what I'm saying? That people were doing stuff, people made sure that they wanted to not be around for that. Um, so I just want to speak to that. So going to you, Baba, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's come up is the way in which, you know, peoples of African descent in this Western Hemisphere and throughout the globe have had to navigate um, the ways in which white folks create exemplars. Create what? That exemplars, right? People who we're supposed to yeah. emulate. Yeah. And... And a part of what that does, as I'm hearing in this conversation, is, is that those exemplars um, and what they model, they model a lot of the behavior that goes contrary to what we talked about. And one of the difficult things, and this goes to Shauna's point, is the ability to identify in ways that is productive. Like, I've had conversations with a lot of people where people who work within institutions that have Black people who have said, you know, Davon, when, when you know when I when I first heard of y'all, I thought y'all didn't like me because I'm in these institutions, and you know. But I I, I talked to you, and now you know, um, I realize that it's more open than that. And I one of the things that I own is I've always had suspicion of people within institutions. Like I take my time to like vet and get to know and ask questions and observe. Sure. Um, but just so in addition to everything that's been said like zeroing in on this particular piece of like, how do we make those distinctions in the most healthy ways? Not necessarily that you, we're gonna be able to avoid conflict. Like just sometimes people are just gonna be mad about it. And you know, that's just what it is. But how would it, but in addition to everything as we said, how, how do you suggest we navigate this dynamic of white folks putting people before our community as leaders or exemplars that are modeling 
the stuff that really goes contrary to what our community needs to do um, in a way, again, in a way that is the most productive. All right, well, uh, great. I'm gonna answer that since you put it there. And I got a whole bunch of other things that I've been taking notes on. So I'm trying to get everybody a job and throwing <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I got a whole list over here. But so let me try to answer that and then and come back to it. Um, uh, it's a lot has been embedded in what's said. It's gonna be important that we let folks who are um, whether they are intending to represent our community or they're taking on the mantle where the white folks have given them that, that we let them know what's required, okay, of us for them, for us, for them to earn our trust, okay? And that's not their personal worth. You're smart, you're worthy. The question is whether or not you will earn our trust in order for us to be able to, to go along with that program, okay? Um, and it's going to be important that we, we just openly talk about it, even when that exemplar is us, for us to say, I got to earn one of the things that Asa Hilliard used to do. He says, for each generation, I got to earn their trust. They don't know me. They don't know my history. Okay. And so I'm put up here and blah, blah, blah. I got to earn it. So um, I have to earn it with you. Okay. Uh, and at the same time, you and others, we have to say, you know, well, it's really nice that you are um, uh, the superintendent of the school district and that you're a black person. Now, here's what we need for you to show us, okay? And here's what needed for me to trust you to do that. Now, we're not talking about your capability in terms of your intellectual capability. We're talking about your allegiance, okay, to us and to our community. Uh, and you're using your smarts to serve us. Now, we know you have to be the superintendent of every school district. I mean, of everybody. And we also know that many times what's required for you to be that is you claim everybody and you minimize black people. And we don't want that to happen. So here's how we want to do that. Now, the, the more open we can get to be in, in that, and that and the, the part that's important in terms of how you make it less conflictual is that you're not talking about the person's heart. You're not talking about their being. You're talking about the socialization that's there and that has been there and likely working for them to actually be selected as the exemplar, okay? Now they can show you, well, I hear that and it certainly looks like that. And I'm, I'm qualified to handle this superintendentship, this management of, well, of this whole thing. And here is what I've not forgotten. And here is what some of my plans are to do. Uh, and we say, cool, this is a beginning conversation. We'll begin, we'll have this conversation with you regularly, okay? You know, and in addition to holding your foot to the fire in a sense of, of building trust between us, we also want to be a support for you because as you said, and, and as, as Shauna said, you can get lost in the sauce, and as Bakara said, and, and so at, with no real meaning to, right? then our job is to say, yo, this ain't good enough for us. This is bump. I'll give you an example. Some of you know Robert F. Williams. Robert F. Williams, Negroes with Guns, was a book. Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, he's there. There was a, a white man raped a, a black woman. And, uh, and he said, let's do deal with this with the law. Okay, he's a you know, lawyer and whatever. And, you know, had all the law, had all this stuff like that. Then white folks just said, bump the law and bump whatever. This white man is getting off from. The black women came to see him and said, see now, we had our own ways of handling this. Now you done made it worse. So they were saying, we willing to, to look, you may have some other stuff there, but you got to have it deliver more than what we already got, okay? And they held his foot to the fire. And he said, if you read his work, he says, at that point, I realized that I had to get clear about what this so-called criminal justice system was and what the game was and what I could do and couldn't do in it. Okay. Uh, and it is there coming to him and saying straight, well, son, we appreciate your effort, but literally your work has made it worse. Being in the conversation. Now, part of what's important in that and other conversations is to distinguish between an attack on the person's being and or essence 
and their behavior or what they do, okay? And we most quickly will go to, you are a tongue. I encourage you not to go there. Focus on the behavior that you don't like, the behavior that is compromising, the behavior that's whatever that you at least see, because you have a number of things. Sometimes you see a behavior and you don't have the whole story. If you identify the behavior, the person may be able to give you some more story to explain the behavior, okay? If you go straight to, well, you know, uh, Danielle, you know, you're Tom, you know, or Thomasina. Well, where I'm gonna go for that? I mean, get, 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 there's nowhere to go except for she gonna agree with or she gonna disagree. We gotta fight. So part of the skill is particularly when there's conflict, how do I stay away from labels and go to the behavior? And in fact, even be able to affirm the being and not the behavior. And there's a skill set we call that ri the river of touches in terms of in terms of that. So I want to say that's one way to do that. Now, and a couple other things that been a lot of stuff has been said. I wanted to sh rattle through some stuff that was come up um, there. You started with demanding our best. Okay. What we need is in addition to demanding our best, which is the expectation, which is absolutely true also get skilled in how to develop our best, okay? We have been wounded, okay? So anybody who comes, we demand the best and we have a process for of development. You are not required to already know everything. You are required to do your best and that needs to increase. I'll give you an example. When uh, black people began to move into Procter & Gamble, okay? I'm 65, so this, I'm, I'm, I was on the tail end of when we, walking and we were in the street, I'm fired up, ain't gonna take no more and blah, blah, blah. And white folks open, start opening this and opening that and black people could go to this college and black people go to this company. So the black managers of Procter & Gamble <clears throat> created an internal black managers organization. When you joined the company, they invited you out to dinner. And they said, here's what we're working on. And here's what's expected of you in as a black manager here. We're not talking about what white people expect of you. We're talking about what we expect of you. For example, we right now need black, more black people to be recruited from Tuskegee and their engineering school and A&T in Greensboro, their engineering school. And these white folks, when they're just going and recruiting, they're just going to their white engineering schools. Now, here's what your assignment is. To, to shadow this white person whose job it is, you play, when you're playing golf and anything else, you are influencing this person such that recruitment begins to happen also at these schools, all right? That is, there was, and, and then every quarter, folk would be called to account, all right? And while this person was influencing this person, there were also behavioral and performance things that had to go on because folks who he doesn't know or she doesn't know is positioning her to literally take this person's place at the same time, he or she has to keep up their work. So literally, that it's like, oh, no, no. We have an agenda within this larger corporation, okay? That needs to be there. Now, that was not a secret organization either, okay? And it, it lasted for years and years. I did training and, and working with them. And when the company tried to say, you can no longer do this, we're not going to prove whatever, then the 90 of those black male managers took their vacations at the same time and we're in a hotel in Atlanta where we were doing the training. That is, they were going to maintain that sense of excellence, both demanding it, also developing it, okay? And that's really critical, because uh, if we just do one without the other, boom. Um, the, uh, Amos Wilson has a phrase that's really important. We are alienated to serve aliens. This is the cultural displacement of Bakara. all right? This is literally the process of alienating us from our community, from our authentic self, from our authentic feelings, from our culture, is so that you get this power, this genius, um, all this to be used in service of alien. So we know it and we see it particularly in sports, right? Where, you know, you're the basketball player, you're the football player, and so you play for Georgetown and Georgetown can win these blah, 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 or whatever school you want. And that also happens intellectually, it also happens in terms of you're, you're emotionally uh, uh, gifted and skilled. You manage well. We're alienated from our culture so that we will serve aliens. That needs to be a, a part of a healing agenda so that you, you understand that I come with some alienation. And part of my goal 
and your goal with me, and then organizationally, is for us to heal this alienation. All right, and it comes in many different ways, but that's a that's a key you know piece you know uh, for me. Um, one person said something about being in uh, institutions. I recommend, if I had it my way, that we would do tag teaming. And you would, you would literally, whether you're talking about a school, whether you're talking about corporate, whether you're talking about whatever, is that we would say, okay, um, this is, we got uh, Shauna, Bakari, Danielle, tag team. Shauna, you go in for three years. You come out. Bakari, you go in for three years. Because Shauna, when you come out, you're going back and working in the black community in our organization. You cannot stay no more than three years without at least coming out for a year to get yourself recentered in this. Now, sometimes people think that's far fetched. I'll tell you the story about the Maori people in New Zealand. When white folks came and did their all oppression and whatever, and they like, okay, we're gonna have these uh, Maori people, which are black people, come to work here in our corporations. When it came to the interview, the Maori negotiated so that nobody would have to go to an interview by themselves because the white person across the table is not just the white person. They represent the police. They represent the whole institution. They may seem to be just you and them, but it's not just you and them. All Karen has to do is call on the phone and you're in jail, okay, if not dead. So they said, uh-uh, ain't going to be none of that. For the interview, people could come with her and even speak for her, okay, or him. If they got the position, they would bring the sister or the brother and says, we are loaning you him or her, mistreat her, and we will come to get her, okay? In that context, you could say, because of oppression, and because oppression continues, and while y'all mean well, right, being with y'all for more than three years can really mess us up, you know, even though you mean well and all that, you ain't there. So guess what? We're negotiating three people to maintain this position over a 25-year period, okay, and negotiate it. Now, this goes back to imagination. Our, we, we already decide we can't do this. This ain't possible. No. We say, here's what we need in order to work, all right, and then do that, all right? So that kind of tag team. Now, short of that, this will be the last thing, okay? Short of that, we need to make sure that we also are always working in our community, that I'm never just working in their community to change their minds or whatever, okay? That part of this sense of excellence, part of them going around and saying, well, Kessel, you're jiving, man. Well, Kessel, we need the best of you. Right? Where they'll get the best of me is in service of my people and my community. And I'm always working as a, a, in a project that is important to the community where that standard is upheld, all right? Where my culture is affirmed, where my being is affirmed, all right? It's really critical for our health that we do that. So, um, so as as we turn to, you want to say something, Danielle? You know, I just wanted to reflect back, if okay, um, some of what I'm hearing and offer offer almost a like almost a more tactical perspective on like the how of how we move forward, especially because this is all about building. And I just want to share that one thing I'm struck by in this conversation, as I was in the last one, is that how, is that so much of what we're describing collectively is 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 within reach. And I hope that our audience is also feeling a sense of like hope and like almost joy in in the sense that while we have literally everything that we need right here at our fingertips and in each other to be able to move an agenda forward. I often think sometimes, you know, um, of like how much we would be able to accomplish as a community if we took a fraction of what we spend on the day to day um, uh, trying to fix what is broken and fix what is not working with us for us uh, and redirect that energy, that capital, that 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 thought into um, what we need as we move forward. What would it look like for us to redirect like so much of that energy into something that really feels consistent with what we know uh, to be true and where we need to be headed? Um, but I just want to I just want to reflect a couple of things back. Now, one, um, Davon, um, you mentioned like in your story, like kind of that that sense of feeling. And I noticed in a lot of the comments that folks were sharing, they also echoed back, like, man, like somebody actually is naming and describing. 
um, something that what I felt. I, I saw some other comments where folks were describing this sense of isolation and, and things like that, which we understand shows up in depression and all kinds of things. I want us to embrace the fact that that feeling, that, that sadness, that sorrow, that depression is a sign that is like, like uh, going back to the spiritual element of this, that's all a sign that this, what we are experiencing is not meant for us, right? And like, I know for me personally, like a turning point in terms of understanding how to channel those feelings of sorrow into something productive was recognizing that that sense of sadness is what is actually communicating to me you know what, something ain't right about what's going on around you and find those people who can support you, help you to understand what you are actually trying to process so that you, you move forward, right? And so that's where the collective element um, comes in. But recognizing that that sense, that sorrow is actually a gift and a sign of that we are in touch with our maker. And so I just want to name that. The other is around translation. So I know we were talking about the framework of warrior, healer, build, builder, but what I also want to reflect back is that we were in many of our stories, we were to, we also had there's this role of like the translator, the first the person that kind of understands all of these different worlds and helps us to see each other. And perhaps that's already inherent in that framework, but I just want to lift that up as another role that is important to recognize and to name the the, the folks that are actually playing that role as we think about who to lift up and who are our kind of bridges to each other. So that's one other piece. Um, I want to name these roles and the importance of protection and in investing in, in, in each other. So like whether you are the warrior out there, you know, fighting, what we've seen is that often our warriors are not protected. And like sometimes they're holding that, that role of being, playing the warrior in a space that takes them away from feeling that their sense of humanity and, 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 and we need to support them in that. We also see our healers like taking on this work as though they aren't human themselves and don't need support, right? So we need to protect them and support them. We see our builders working in various institutional contexts and trying to build, but also without that protection and that, that recognition, right? And so a part of our responsibility is to see each other, reflect back, but also figure out how to protect, better protect each other so that we can do the work that we need to do in, uh, as a collective. Danielle, and last, Danielle, oh, go ahead. Sure right in there, just so, for clarity. For us, we all must become skilled warriors as well as builders. So we do no longer have a warrior who is also not a healer and a builder. Oh, I love that, yes. We, we do not yes. have a healer that just wants to, mm, but they do not understand yes. that we're at war and we got to, boom. <laughs> Absolutely. Or we got a builder who just says, oh, no, it ain't about race, it ain't about nothing, you just make a big, no, no. We all have to develop that skill set. All right. Although, yes, you may be doing one more, one or the other, because with that development, that I think that's set, absolutely got right. those bridges. So, yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. And I, I think that just like having more space to actually talk about these frameworks and name these frameworks and to be able to see ourselves in that, I think, is a part of the work going forward, absolutely. because this is about a process and it's a process that we have to be committed to. And I just want to name that again. We talk about commitment to studying, to you know, to to kind of sitting at the feet of folks who know what to share with us, so that we can kind of see the path forward. The other is that um, I just want to lift up like the power of capital and how much capital and potential we have within our community. As someone who comes from the space of investing, right? Like I look at like where the dollars flow, and it's amazing to see how much in the way of resource flows right outside of our community and we need to bring it back in. I'm talking about financial resource, intellectual resource, emotional capital, you know? And so again, we have to get a little bit more protective about harnessing that, but then also doing the work of mediating some of these existing environments while protecting the space to, to create something new. And that requires some really honest conversations about who's playing which roles and when, it also requires a conversation that I hope we have in a future state around allyship, which we haven't touched on, but I wanna talk about that at some point in terms of like what that really means and who, who that is and who that is not, um, so that more folks can actually see themselves in this, um, this conversation. Um, and then lifting each other up. Uh, we talked about this thing of the exemplars, like a part of the solution, and I think that we already see our folks doing this, is like lift each other up. Like if they're not actually being recognized in some spaces, we have folks and platforms that we can create ourselves. I want to lift up like the example of collectively where, you know, our brother Jamie Wooten has like literally been just lifting folks up and giving them a platform so that we know who these folks are. 
So these are just a few kind of tactical, tactical takes on like, okay, like what can we do and what's within reach? Because I'm hoping that as a result of this conversation, we continue to ground this and say, you know what? We can get, we can go get into action, y'all. Like let's like actually make a very practical use of what we've been discussing. I love that. So that, I mean, that, yeah. Let me just say, you know, um, we're 22 years, 23, you know, 24 years old uh, in terms of putting things on the ground. And one of the things we, to your point, our community is long on ought tos and short on how tos. And so part of the work is to go to how do we do it? We, we can quickly come to we ought to be unified. Cool. Then how do we do it? Because that's where the learning, that's where the growth happens. So I'm echoing you, uh, let's, let's do stuff. And there are people who are doing it. It's not like you got to start from scratch. We're doing it, other people are doing it, and let's keep on going. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. And, and so just, you go, go ahead, Shah, I just want to say uh, for you and Bakara, we're going to turn to conclude. So you know, put these in the form of like, you know, final comments um, so we can sign off. So go ahead, Sean. So I just wanted to um, amplify a couple of the questions um, in the chat. So one is, the question was, within community, how do you call people out and call them in? Um, I want to, I'm going to speak to that in a second. And then, uh, and then the issue of alienation within community, because I think these things are actually connected. Um, so I think I, I want to preface this by saying that in many ways, I can speak to Baltimore. So in Baltimore, we, there is calling in that happens, um, sometimes successfully <laughs> and sometimes not so much because of the need for this the, the sort of fortification and forward movement and collaboration and establishing solid institutions so that folks understand the level of accountability that actually can happen. And not accountability in a negative way, but just accountability and support that happens um, in, in each sector. So the, the f first, I think it's important to define who community is. Um, I think I mean, and I really don't like doing like these definitive things, but when I'm talking about calling in and or out, I'm really talking about uh, black folk in community that are doing work to uplift um, and or that speak or say that they're doing work to uplift, but their behavior is such that that is contrary. <laughs> So the way that um, I'm often a person that because of my healing work in community, I'm often a person called on to support and calling folks in and holding space so that harm doesn't happen. Um, the challenge that often comes up that I think is um, really important when we're thinking about the, the influence um, and the destruction of white institution and power when we're trying to do this work is that, you know, because I, folks do know me in community for holding healing space and I've been really consistent at doing that and also been a person where folks can come to for support and insight, guidance, connection, referral, whatever. Um, I think the chief aspect of this is already established trust, right? So it's really hard to call someone in that is a stranger if there is not some sense of connectedness some sense of, of, of safety, meaning and safety in that I'm not, I'm not, no one's gonna tear you down. It's a space for healing, uh, a space for reconciliation. I think that is a, a, a necessary um, component to when you're talking about calling someone in. If you've been cussing them out, talking about them, y'all don't really know each other like that, they don't know you from whatever, the 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 like what you have to say means not, it means not a thing, right? So the calling in often means I'm reaching out, right? I am, you know, reaching out hopefully with other folks in community that, that also have an established relationship, trust and connection and sharing first by identifying or acknowledging what may be happening for them in a way that honors their humanity and the things that they've, the things that they are likely struggling with without the intention of tearing down. To, to what Danielle would you um, articulate it pretty eloquently, is, is the, the challenge of that is that I don't know that there are many, there are some, there's, there's a cadre of us, but there's not a lot of us 
that have been consistently doing the work of communing and establishing ongoing trust and experiences to establish a, 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 a understood quote institution for where this happens. So what that means is that sometimes we feel the need or are required or have to call someone in and they decide they ain't participating. Like, you know, like even if there is established trust, right, there might be trust in some ways, but then the emotion or the feeling of guilt or what we've been talking about, we're talking about excellence or whatever, it, or perhaps they have their own emotional, spiritual or wellness challenges that get in the way of them actually being on the receiving end of the truths that need to be acknowledged. I often try to do, do this work um, and alongside elders that have been been, um, that have been doing the work for some time, but it is really challenging because the reality um, that I think that we are working to dismantle, to destroy, is that when you have white institutions that are lifting up, there, there was a request about a, how do you overcome white appointed exemplars? Well, you know, oftentimes the folks that need to be called in are all, often also the folks that are white appointed exemplars, right? And so the challenge is that then it becomes this uh, 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 ever present war. I mean, I think it's just really important to say, you know, where it's like, and we're going to diminish whatever community has to say, and the white institution does the work to destroy. Um, or to diminish, to, to disacknowledge the work that's being done. And so when we're talking about alienation, um, I think communication is really important and having uh, fortified and continued spaces to be able to have these tough conversations, having folks that are, that are elders and that have, that have the skill set of being able to hold the space so that this can happen. And I think it, I, I wanted to lift this up specifically too, because it is really important when we're talking about the cultivation of black institutions. I think this is one of the things that actually get like literally makes it challenging for us to look beyond a three to five year frame and actually start planning 10, 15 and 20 years ahead is that when we reach a point where, where something needs to be corrected, the absence of vulnerability, the unwillingness to be held, or the absence of, an, of, of a fortified, supported, protected institution for doing this kind of work um, makes it really challenging. And so, and that's, that's, I, that's it. That's what I got. <laughs> So I know, so Bob, I know you got to hop off um, right at eight. So what I'm going to do is um, if you just want to um, say any parting words and then we'll jump over to you, Bakari, for, for the last word. Uh, well, thank you all. I really, really, really enjoyed being here. Uh, it's good to get to uh, know and hear you and meet you in this space, every, every one of you. Um, and uh, it's, it's just been wonderful. And I do think it needs to continue. We need to continue. Uh, Y'all are the bomb. And I mean that. I don't care about accolades <laughs> easily. Um, and at the same time, I give them easily when they're served. Uh, we have an Angolo um, meeting. Mama P has been holding down the first hour, so I'm going to go uh, to the second hour uh, to, to do that. And um, look forward to work with you. Okay. Take care. Yes. All right. Thanks, Bob. All right, Bakari, you get the last word. Ooh. Um, so last night I watched the IG Live about accountability um, that specifically within the black queer um, and trans community. Um, there's an organizer based in like New York, New Jersey named Joe. I was gonna lift their name up. Um, that's, that spoke, they were speaking specifically to um, call out culture. Um, I think it's important. I think language is important. So the introduction of, for me, the language and the reminder that we can also call in as opposed to, I think what often is framed in this very um, abrasive and what I think it's very easy to become as equally as oppressive as the behavior that you're trying to transform um, is call out culture. I'm not opposed to call out culture, but I think um, I think we have to kind of get to the point of having like some cultural norms around, you know, what are the, those rules of engagement. Um, but one of the things that Joe said at the end of that um, live was that um, sharing with folks, before, hopefully before we get to the point um, of needing to be held accountable, but sharing with folks how we individually want to be held accountable. And that I felt like was so simple, but it was like, it was super powerful for me because it's like, well, how do I want to be held accountable? I'm very, 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 very 
very incredibly outrageously blessed to have so many black feminine women in my life that um, hold me accountable sometimes in the means of just like, hey, your slip is showing and other times in the mean of catch this drag. Um, I'm thankful for it all. I, you know, it is a blessing. But I think, you know, for me, that person saying, what does it look like for you to be held accountable and then to share that with people proactively as opposed to waiting for waiting to find out what it looks like reactively. So I think as we start to have further those conversations are, around infrastructure and as Danielle, I think has highlighted and, and Shauna, you just came through and just rained down on everybody, just reiterating the importance of spirit is it is spiritual work. So saying how we want to be held accountable, how we want to be called to task in those spaces is again, just going back to that, that self-awareness and doing that self-work for ourselves first so that we can say, okay, now when it comes my turn for you to, for you to tell me how I'm, I'm messing up, this is, this is how, you know, I, you know, I'm a, don't, don't pull me out in, in public or can we have a one-off? Can we have a, you know, as multiple people, can we always make sure we have a mediator in that space? And that may, may look different from one person to the next in terms of having the kid gloves on and, and all that, as people say, but I think really doing the investigation about what that looks like for ourselves individually is I think the space that we need to be in and work towards. So thank y'all both for um, allowing me to be in this space and sharing your brilliance in this space. I, I said it last week and I said it on my Facebook when I shared, but it has been so healing for me and so impactful and so important to be in space with, um, with folks in community to have just, a ounce, a portion of um, of hope, and that level of the reminder that there's resilience very present with, with within ourselves. So, thank y'all. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to say, you know, to the family that you know took the time to watch. Um, just want to first thank our panelists. Um, you know, amazing um, cast of panelists that really gave a variety of perspectives. So I think it's going to be really important. I imagine we'll do you know in another iteration of this one of the thing, couple of things i want to say before we sign off um one is that um, we're going to put up some information about the warrior healer build a framework and opportunities to connect with um baba wakasa and mama afia um for folks who are interested in like using those tools here locally in baltimore um you know i do think toward you know kind of what, what bakari just mentioned about finding ways to institutionalize um and shauna mentioned this too ways to institutionalize um, how we deal with each other, how we hold each other accountable, how we deal with conflicts. Think about ways to institutionalize that that doesn't rely on white institutions and the people they put up to, to deal with our conflicts, because I think that's a big part. I think there's so much, there's so much of that, and it's so normalized that I think this conversation has done a great job of helping to lift that up so that people can start to see things around them um, to help identify that dynamic. And so, so again, we'll put up those resources. I think it lead, it'll hopefully lead it empty into um, a solidification of an infrastructure around conflict and resolution and, and accountability. And the last thing I want to say, um, again, this is Dave Love, Director of Public Policy Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, um, you know, grassroots political think tank. You know, these are conversations that are a part of our commitment to our community. Um, and so we hope that, you know, you support our work in other ways, um, you know, our legislative work, our political work. We hope you support our work in other ways as we continue to bring you um, the kind of conversations we can have tonight. One of the things I'm really proud of as an organization is that we can bring together spaces like this um, that really go to show that when you're committed to Black people and you're committed kind of unapologetically to Black people, um, I think we've demonstrated we have everything we need. We just got to pull it together. Um, so again, thank, thank our panelists. Thank the family for watching. Um, stay tuned for the next installment. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening.